Jeffrey, and as always, very glad to see all of you here today for our, our book review on Oliver Sacks, On the Move, A Life. And our reviewer today is Dr. Frederick Marshall. Dr. Marshall earned his medical degree from Harvard in 1989 and joined the U of R faculty in 1996. He's currently the Chief of Geriatric Neurology Unit at the U of R Medical Center, the Chief of Neurology at Monroe Community Hospital, and the Director of Strong's Memory Care Program. So who better to review the story of a brilliant neurosurgeon, Oliver Sacks, who shows how the brain makes us human. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marshall. Thank you very much. I want to just stipulate Dr. Sachs was a neurologist, not a neurosurgeon. And I'm a neurologist, not a neurosurgeon. Uh, we make those uh, decisions very early on in our careers. And, uh, I think the interesting story of Dr. Sachs's life is the tension that, it, that exists between artistry and science. Uh, and the walk that he managed to walk between those two um, superficially very different worlds that turn out to have been completely enhanced by his life, one the other. There's a mutual synergy that happens in the emergence of his life. And I want to just um, uh, say I have very few prepared remarks and I'm not going to be using slides, but I did want to read a little bit uh, to start us off with just the context for why I care about Dr. Sachs. The first is, as, as she mentioned, I graduated medical school in 1989, and we were blessed at Harvard to have Dr. Sachs give us our commencement address that year. So the first time I met Dr. Sachs was at the commencement address for Harvard Medical School in 1989, and he struck me at the time as somewhat of an eccentric character. My good friend was the, was the president of the class, and it devolved upon her to meet him, and he took the train up from New York to Boston. She met him at the train, and uh, she had a driver ready to go, and she accompanied him to the medical school to give the address. And her recollection of Dr. Sachs is that he uh, was riding feverishly in the car <laughs> on the way, and what was interesting about him was that he had four different colored pens. And if you look at the picture on the back of his biography, you see in his lapel pocket are the four different colored pens. And the entire time, he would be plucking one color and writing notes in a particular color. And he explained to her that he wrote his notes in different colors depending on the nature of the ideas. Right? And he acknowledges in this book at the end that he kept over the course of his lifetime more than a thousand journals. Right? He was primarily a writer. Uh, and foremost, he, he gelled his thoughts as a writer. He, he, he really would never dream of doing what I'm doing now, I think. Dr. Sachs probably would not have spoken extemporaneously. He would have had prepared remarks. Um, because he found that his thoughts congealed in the context of writing. And I must say, if, if I had had more time, I would have done a better job for you today. I probably would have spent more time writing and rewriting. But this is who I am. I'm actually a very busy clinician. And um, my wife just won the Democratic nomination for school board in the city, Liz Hallmark. And uh, I, I was Liz's campaign manager. So I've been very busy myself. And we just had our porch fest on Mulberry Street where we live over the weekend with 20 different concerts on porches over the course of our closed block. Um, and my trio played. So um, I uh, mentioned to Gisela, who asked me to please call out Dr. Sachs's relationship to music as a core and central aspect of his values and his brilliance in understanding the impact of music on the therapy of individuals and what it can unlock in people. So um, he's clearly a, a primarily a classical aficionado, uh, which emerges in his book. But I myself migrated from classical to jazz many years ago. And as usual, you know, I kind of have feelings of inadequacy when I think about that compared to the great Dr. Sachs. But I'll just start with a few things. So I was a first year medical student in 1985-86, uh, the year that the book 
of his neurological narratives, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, was published. I'd studied philosophy and psychology as an undergraduate and had long been interested in the nature of human experience, in particular the nature of knowledge and the puzzling relationship between the brain and the mind. To me, starting my medical training, Sachs's book was both a revelation and an inspiration. In part, as a result of this book, I determined that neurology was a strong possibility for my future. And then over the course of the next four years, in, in part because of the reception that I had when I told my professors that I was um, a fan of Dr. Sachs, I actually was almost dissuaded from neurology. One of the interesting things about this biography is um, that it emerges that Dr. Sachs's relationship to my field, to the field of neurology as an academic and professional organization, was often fraught. It was quite an estranged relationship throughout much of his career. I remember the first time I was wearing a short white coat as a, uh, a, a medical student in the first couple of years, which are largely devoted to um, uh, didactic training in lecture, home, in lecture halls, but every now and then they spring you and you get to wear a little white coat and go into the wards and meet the real doctors and see the real patients. And the first time I did that, I had a preceptor who happened to be a neurologist, and he was a distinguished professor of neurology at Harvard. And I said to him, thinking that I would curry favor, I love Dr. Sachs's book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. I find it inspiring. And he sort of looked at me and clucked, sort of winced almost. And it became very clear that he had no respect at all for Dr. Sachs. One of the things that um, I think was quite sad for Dr. Sachs throughout his career was that he was truly never fully embraced by the academy. And the walk that he walked was a sort of peripheral walk within the confines of what we would think of as a distinguished academic career in neurology. Um, and I want to just quote a few little things from him in this respect. It really started off as a tension between himself as a researcher and himself as a clinician. He had grown up during World War II as a child in the London um, uh, bombings um, and was evacuated to a terrible boarding school where he and his uh, two-year older brother Michael, who went on to develop schizophrenia, uh, were essentially brutalized uh, by the headmasters and, and the teachers in the school. And um, they sort of sought refuge with one another, and, and, and at least Oliver with two very good friends, his, his friends uh, Jonathan Miller and Eric Korn, who are, light, are through lines throughout this book, if you read it. Um, but um, they had a kind of love of science that promulgated them towards aspirations of careers in science. And eventually he took examinations he had done very well uh, and, and um, got into Oxford, as had his older siblings. And it was sort of one of those families where everybody was a doctor and everybody was going to become a, a doctor, whether they wanted to or not. And uh, he, he wound up at Oxford trying to study anatomy and essentially flunked. He got like the worst grade in the class in his anatomy courses as an undergraduate. And to sort of salve his wounds, he went into a bar and promptly inebriated himself. And on the way home, decided that he would sit for an examination for a distinguished prize in anatomy. And there were six questions that he could go through, one of which he decided to, to uh, grapple with. And for two hours, he wrote an essay. And despite the fact that he had only answered one question, he won the distinguished prize in anatomy at Oxford which um, sort of, I think, revitalized his relationship with his mother. Fascinating family, but um, the, to not get too far ahead of myself, the experience of growing up in the London bombings and having been taken care of totally inadequately at the school that was designed to shelter him was obviously a really traumatic experience for him. and. Um, uh, he talks about the possibility that um, such an experience really meant that he would never be able to bond. Uh, and I think 
that's true in a way. He never really was able to bond with, uh, until the very end of his life, with a long-term relationship with Billy Hayes, the writer. But that didn't happen until he was 75. He had an asexual life, essentially, from the age of 40 until the age of 75. But he discovered his homosexuality very early on in his life. And his father was permissive of this, or at least acknowledged it, whereas his mother, um, whom he had implored his father not to tell, came downstairs after hearing it and said to him, you're an abomination, I wish I had never had you. Right? So Oliver, growing up in the England of the 1940s and 50s, and if you've seen the movie on um, the Bletchley touring, you know, touring the famous mathematician who basically invented modern computing, had, had been chemically castrated when they found out that he was homosexual. And the homosexuality had to be very much guarded and clandestine. So here's Oliver at Oxford sort of discovering his, 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 uh, his homosexuality and trying to keep it under wraps and completely sort of alienated by his mother whom he loved dearly. He had been her favorite. Um, thinking about what he wanted to do with his life and he decided he would try to become a neuroscientist. And people need to understand there's, uh, there's sort of neuroscience which is really part of the academy and then there's w what I do for a living which is neurology and even though I'm at a medical school mostly what I do is take care of patients. Right? I have colleagues who do research and I've done a fair amount of research. Dr. Sachs had aspirations to do research but every time he tried to do it he failed. He was just not very good at research either in the either in the laboratory or um, uh, uh, at Oxford or subsequently as a medical student uh, um, or elsewhere. Um, so that theme of failing as a researcher came many times. Here's a, I find his footnotes the most revealing thing in this entire biography. Every, every time I see a footnote, I, you see it, I encourage you to read them. He says here, perhaps I had never really expected to succeed in research in a 1960 letter to my parents wondering about doing research in physiology at UCLA, I wrote, quote unquote, I'm probably too temperamental, too indolent, too clumsy, and even too dishonest to make a good research worker. The only, thing I really enjo the only things I really enjoy are talking, reading, and writing. And then in the same letter home, he quotes a letter that he had received from his childhood best friend, Jonathan Miller, who remained his friend for 70 years. Right? It says, and I quoted a letter I had just received from Jonathan Miller, who writing about himself, Eric, and me, said, I am like Wells, enchanted by the prospect and paralyzed by the reality of scientific research. The only place where any of us move nimbly or with grace is with ideas and words. Our love of science is utterly literary. Right. I think it's fascinating that he, he sort of had this insight about himself as a neurologist early on that his contribution was going to be a literary science. Right. And I think he invites us as a field to embrace the humanities. As you read this, biography, um, it's astonishing how much a man of letters, a man of humanism, a man of science, really, he was. The book is titled On the Move. And just to sketch out his particulars very quickly and so that you can hear what I'm saying in context if you haven't yet read the book. So he's born and raised as a child through the war in London and actually goes to Oxford and then after Oxford does his internship in London at a distinguished hospital in Middlesex. And then he's thinking it's time for the draft in England and I'm not so sure I'm cut out to be a soldier. And uh, he decides that he'll leave England but he wants to be of some service and he's romanticized motorcycles and airplanes and decides that he's gonna go to Canada and join the uh, the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. 
And so he comes and starts meeting with uh, the RA, uh, what is it, the RACA, CA, what, I don't know what the, RACF, right? Um, the RCAF. Yeah. I can figure it out eventually. I'm listexic, so please forgive me. Yeah. So, um, after about three months of a prolonged interview, the colonel involved says, "Look, li listen, Sachs, I just, I don't think you're cut out for this. You should go and do your science." And and he takes a long motorcycle ride across Canada, and then eventually, after um, great adventures that he writes about in the book, he winds up in San Francisco, not as an American citizen, but with a green card, and with a letter from. Kramer, who had been his clinician, clinical chief at Middlesex Hospital during his internship, to some distinguished folks at the University of California, San Francisco, neuroscientists, whom he promptly gets a job with and starts to kind of settle in in San Francisco. And of course, San Francisco in that era is the, is, you know, he's hanging out with Beats and uh, uh, getting to explore his sexuality some, which he talks about. And he comes across, actually his friend Jonathan, sends him a poem by Thomas Gunn. Do any of you know who Thomas Gunn is? He's a, he's a, he's a famous poet um, and also an explorer of LSD and acid and the homosexual scene in San Francisco and um, ultimately a, a, a part-time lecturer at Berkeley. But uh, his, his old friend Jonathan sends him uh, a letter in, with a poem and says, you must meet Thomas Gunn, who himself had grown up in London and lived through the, the, uh, the Blitz and was an expat uh, Brit living in... Sorry, let me talk up. So I'm going to read the poem called On the Move by Thomas Gunn, who was an important early, I think, although it's not explicitly stated, paramour of, of Saxes in San Francisco. On the move. The blue jay scuffling in the bushes follows some hidden purpose, and the gusts of birds that spurts across the field, the wheeling swallows, has nested in the trees and undergrowth. Seeking their instinct or their poise or both, one moves with an uncertain violence under the dust thrown by a baffled sense or the dull thunder of approximate words. On motorcycles up the road they come, small, black as flies, hanging in heat, the boys, until the distance throws them forth, their hum bulges to thunder held by calf and thigh, in goggles donned in personality, in gleaming jackets trophied with the dust, they strap in doubt by hiding it, robust, and almost hear a meaning in their noise. Exact conclusion of their hardiness has no shape yet, but from known whereabouts they ride, direction where the tires press. They scare a flight of birds across the field. Much that is natural to the will must yield. Men manufacture both machine and soul, and use what they imperfectly control to dare a future from the taken roots. It is a part solution, after all. One is not necessarily discord on earth, or damned because half animal one lacks direct instinct because one wakes afloat on movement that divides and breaks. One joins the movement in a valueless world, choosing it till both hurler and the hurled, one moves as well, always toward, toward. A minute holds them who have come to go, the self-defined astride the created, Will they burst away? The towns they travel through are home for neither bird nor holiness, for birds and saints complete their purposes. At worst, one is in motion, and at best, reaching no absolute in which to rest, one is always nearer by not keeping still. I love that last line. One is always nearer by not keeping still. So that's actually the poem on the move that Tom Gunn wrote, from which this book gets its title. The poem doesn't appear in the book, but I, that was the one actual piece of literary research I did for you. <laughs> um, 
So one of the things that was unique about Dr. Sachs was that not only was he a writer, but he was a teacher. And he talks a lot about his process of becoming a neurologist. One of his um, sort, one of his places of discontent was that the field tends to be ahistorical. Right. A little chapter at UCLA, we residents had a weekly journal club. We would read the latest papers in neurology and discuss them. I sometimes annoyed the group, I think, by saying that we should also discuss the writings of our 19th century forebears, relating what we were seeing in patients to their observations and thoughts. This was seen by the others as archaism. We were short of time, and we had better things to do than consider such obsolete matters. This attitude was reflected implicitly in many of the journal articles we read. They made little reference to anything more than five years old. It was as if neurology had no history. I found this dismaying, for I think in narrative and historical terms. As a chemistry mad boy, I devoured books on the history of chemistry, the, evaluation, the evolution of its ideas, and the lives of my favorite chemists. Chemistry had for me a historical and human dimension, too. Have any of you read Uncle Tungsten, Memoirs of a Chemical Boyhood? Oh, that's his book about, that's his memoir about his boyhood. And it's quite remarkable. It's sort of the other balance to this book. I loved it. It's sort of um, uh, really almost a poem to the beauty of the periodic table. <laughs> So after, after um, what turned out to be a sort of thwarted, uh, stymied uh, love affair with a man with whom he never actually had sex um, in Los Angeles during his residency, um, a man who left when it became apparent to him that Oliver was thinking about him amorously, Oliver bought a small home up Topanga Canyon and in Los Angeles, Topanga Canyon subsequently became sort of another uh, barrio of the, of the Bohemians. But at the time that Sachs was living there, it wasn't quite yet that. Um, and unfortunately, he sank into drug addiction. I was astonished to hear all of these things about my idol, right? The picture of him, which is the one picture I should, I don't know whether you can see it, but that's Oliver Sacks astride a BMW motorcycle with a leather jacket looking like James Dean, right? At that era in his life. And he became quite addicted to amphetamine, to methamphetamine. He basically struggled for four or five years with a descent into methamphetamine addiction. And one of his books, Hallucinations, is based on his personal observations of that process. He ultimately left UCLA, uh, where he had not been a very distinguished resident, and got a fellowship working with a guy named Feinstein, who was then the chief of the headache unit at Einstein Hospital in New York. And one of the more dismaying stories in this book is how Feinstein, who had at first taken a liking to him, tried to thwart his very first efforts at literary neurology. On vacation, after working very hard in the clinic, Oliver had the experience of um, feeling motivated to write about the migraineurs, the migraineuses. By the way, the migraineuse and the migraineur, you understand that distinction. It's the French for women versus men with migraine. But he wrote about migraine in a way that was literary and showed his work to his chief, who was then, I think, also at the time, chief of the American Headache Society. He was a powerful, full professor at Einstein. And, and, and Feinstein went berserk, essentially. He, he got very angry and forbade him to publish it. He, he made a show of sending the manuscript out uh, for review. Um, and over the next couple of weeks, Oliver saw that Feinstein's secretary was photocopying the manuscript. Anyway, the review came back completely anonymized so that Oliver never knew who had written the review, but it was essentially a scathing ad hominem attack against him. Eventually, Oliver had to decide, was he gonna, 
Was he going to hide his light under a bushel, as we Quakers say? Or was he going to publish the book anyway? And he published it in London. And then started coming letters from people saying, we didn't realize that you had previously published versions of this under the pseudonym Feinstein. He had a series of tragic accidents like that. He wrote whole books, a, a manuscript, you know, ready for, for publication, but he had written it out and typed it out, and he was taking it back and forth on his motorcycle. And uh, on uh, the Bronx Bridge, the elastic broke, and his manuscript, the only copy of it, fell into dense traffic. And he watched, trying to dart in and out of traffic while tires were ripping up his manuscript and trying to get his pages back and finally gave it up. You know? Time after time, there are little stories, anecdotes like that in his life. And I think his solution for it was to just become sort of inured to it. He almost became like a Buddhist with a mandala. I mean, with a, with a, with a, a mandala? Is that what you call it? You know, the, the, the Tibetans who will make this beautiful work of art in sand and then brush it all away as a practice of letting go. I think he did a lot of letting go in his life. And the more he let go, the deeper he, he got, truly, as, a, as, a, as a, a person who could allow himself to be loved, eventually, um, and as an observer of, of humanity. So um, there's many more anecdotes, but I'm aware of the time, and I know that we end in about 12 minutes. So uh, it's very precise. It's from 12 after to 12.52. That's so that all of you who are working downtown can get back to your offices. How many of you work downtown and came here from an office? <laughs> okay. so, so I gather it's really so three of the people in the audience can get back to work. But I'd like to, to throw it open and we'll have a little discussion. I'm sure there are questions and, and thoughts about Dr. Sachs and his life. As you know, between the time of the publication of the book and now, he did pass away of a metastatic melanoma. And even that, having originated in one eye and blinded him, was a source of clinical observation for Dr. Sachs. He was fascinated with what happened to him as he lost his stereoscopic vision. Yes, sir. I think of the brain as the domain of neurologists, and this is actually probably false. And the mind is the domain of psychiatrists. Remember, and uh, I guess that comes from a Cartesian dualism that goes way back, the separation of mind and body. But this relationship between the brain and the mind, to me, has always been the most fascinating one. How is it that this piece of meat in our skull can transduce all of our experience? Not just our motor function and our rudimentary sensory function, but our highest ideals, our, our sense of spirituality. Every experience that you've ever had living in there and accessible to your memory until you're ravaged by old age or dementia. It's fascinating. It's just intrinsically fascinating. You know, the human brain is the most complex structure in the known universe. But it's less than clear even now to neuroscience that the mind, that is, that, that whole collection of what I just described, is coextensive with the brain. How the brain mediates consciousness is still a topic of great interest. And in the last chapter of his book, he talks about Edelman, the famous Nobel, Nobel laureate who's now on, you know, thinking in new ways about the frontier of neuroscience and in a very positivistic sense, thinking that we're going to solve the origin of consciousness between now and 2030. I find that a dubious proposition, but it is amazing uh, how the the motor program can be unleashed like that. And diseases of the basal ganglia. I came to Rochester in 94 to, to do a fellowship in movement disorder neurology and, and migrated from being a movement disorder neurologist, which I still do one day a week, to being a cognitive neurologist. Um, but the, the subcortical structures of the brain that mediate movement 
can toggle back and forth between what we call hyperkinesia and hypokinesia, too much or too little movement. Um, there are stories of patients with relatively advanced Parkinson's disease who, in the, in the, in the uh, heat of a moment, seeing a child trapped under a vehicle or something can suddenly unleash the motor program entirely and go and struggle with the bumper and in a Herculean way, lift up the car and extricate the child. Astonishing capacities. And, and Sachs, by the way, just as an anecdote, speaking of Herculean, did you know Sachs held the record for squat lift in California? He squatted 650 pounds. Sachs weighed 250 pounds and was a muscle beach guy driving a motorcycle through his residency. I mean, it's just, we think of him as a sort of demure British guy with maybe a little bit of an eccentricity, but he was a macho. He was a macho. The academy thrives on the quantifiable. Um, I'll give you a quote of that, actually. And it's very threatening when somebody speaks a truth that is orthogonal to the kind of truth that we've all decided we're going to speak. Um, around that time, I had a discussion with my chief at Einstein. He's talking about Awakenings, his book on the von Economos encephalitis, the sleeping sickness, and the administration of levodopa that was really his probably his finest work from a literary point of view. That's his book, Awakenings, and the subsequent movie that you alluded to with Robin Williams. Um, so he's working on the case histories of Awakenings. He's working with his patients 18 hours a day. He's living in an apartment provided by the long-term care hospital just so that he can be with them in the middle of the night so that he can truly understand what their lived experience is. Right? So, Around this time, I had a discussion with my chief at Einstein, Leib Scheinberg. How many patients do you have on L-DOPA, he asked me. Three, sir, I replied eagerly. Gee, Oliver, Leib said, I have 300 patients on L-DOPA. And Oliver replies, yes, but I learn 100 times as much about each patient as you do. <laughs> <laughs> he had been stung by this, you know, by this, by this, by the sarcasm. And then he says, in the footnote again, read these footnotes if you read the book. He said, Series are needed. All sorts of generalizations are made possible by dealing with populations. But one needs the concrete, the particular, the personal too. And it is impossible to convey the nature and impact of any neurological condition without entering and describing the lives of individual patients. I, you know, I can speak to my own trajectory because in addition to movement disorder neurology, I came to study experimental therapeutics of neurodegenerative disorders. And Rochester, as it turns out, is a hub of that activity. Ira Scholson, whom maybe some of you may have known, was truly um, a remarkable guy who, who leveraged what at the time was the largest clinical trial ever funded by NIH in Parkinson's disease into an infrastructure that by the time I arrived employed about 20 full-time staff to do clinical trials, multi-center clinical trials, prospective, double-blind, placebo-controlled, what the scientific journals refer to as the kinds of studies that can generate grade A evidence that staff has subsequently grown to about 60 people, and over the last 20 or 30 years, Rochester has been the hub of the development of, uh, let's see, Rosagiline, Mirapex, Ropinirol, Rotigotine, um, Enticapone. There are at least, I think altogether, Ira had seven new drug applications approved by the FDA. Most neurologists would be delighted to have one. So the therapeutics, the advance of therapeutics in Parkinson's disease has marched according to a different, a different drummer than the case report. And the, this, you know, the journals 
publish that kind of massive endeavor. Looking at the authorship of a paper, a multicenter clinical trial, which may cost several million dollars to conduct, is like sitting at the end of a Hollywood blockbuster film and watching the trailer go by. I mean, there are truly hundreds of people involved in that kind of science. Right? So the scientific community has moved away from the sort of lone, very careful, precise clinical observation. I should probably wrap up, but I'll just say that I've moved personally largely away from doing that kind of work to being in the clinic. I think in part as I've become more attracted to that kind of work um, and why I've become more attracted to that work, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm trying to channel in a vague and pallid sort of way, Oliver. Right? But I do think that there's a lot to be said for the retail delivery of medicine. That is, the retail delivery of medicine. What happens between a clinician and a patient in the privacy of, of an exam room is, is still really where we deliver our care. Or in, even better, as, as Oliver's father, who practiced for 70 years and died at age 92, I think, as a general practitioner in London, in the in the privacy of people's kitchens and bedrooms, right, doing home visits to the bitter end, long after he couldn't drive, having a taxi take him around so that he could visit patients and tell the young ones that their great-great-grandfather had had a similar kind of condition. Right. So. All right, I should finish. I guess I get to draw the, uh, thank you.